One of the most earth-shattering CSGO team shuffles. We've had three players leave Fnatic, <clears throat> all three former major champions, and we had two players join from Godsend, and then a third player joined Fnatic who'd been a stand-in. So what happened was Crims, JW, Flusher, three members who were part of the lineup which won Two majors in 2015, Katowice 2015, Cologne 2015. There were three members of the call along with Olaf. Uh, they've left Fnatic and they've gone to join Godsent, which is Pronax's team where Schneider plays. Obviously, JW and Flasher have history with Schneider because Pronax and Schneider were where they won the first major. Well, well yeah, the first major in CSGO history with Fnatic though as well. And Pauf was removed from Godsent to make room for these three players. And Lecro and Twist have left Godsent to join Fnatic, uh, taking up two of the spots, the three spots vacated by those players. And Wenton joins Fnatic as well. Wenton obviously had been the stand in for the ESL Pro League Season 3 final, offline finals, but then was removed. And he was actually the second stand in after they used Plesson initially online. So, earth shattering move. It actually totally changes the fortunes of both teams. But also, interestingly enough, it's not one where it's obvious as to who won here. Even though my speculation is looking at the direction of that the players are going and the way the moves are announced, I have to figure that the people who instigated this move were the fanatic players. It was Crims, JW, and Flusher. If I had to guess, it's mainly JW and Flusher. My own speculation. Wanted to go and reunite with Pronax. Crims, for whatever reason, is the odd man out from the now that Olaf Scott Dennis is his bud. For, just seems like that's the way the team, the split in the team had been done again. Interestingly enough, that's part of that's an aspect actually of human psychology that people don't understand is that human cultures will actually naturally um, seem to divide themselves up into certain hierarchical groups of like the leader and then like a guy who's the second best guy and then the runt of the letter. And what they even found in studies well at least the ones I read, were that if you took all the runts of the litter, like the guy who's the odd man out, the guy who doesn't seem to fit in anywhere and doesn't have a lot of friends, if you get a whole bunch of them and put them put them on an island somewhere, even that will then split into another hierarchy of ones like the alpha, the ones the runt of the runt of the litters, and the ones like in the middle, and the ones the guy who helps out the alpha guy and gets his power that way. Human dynamics work that way. So I think in the past it was it was proposed that when Pronax left, Part of the reason why was Pronax's only bud really was Devil Walk at that point in time. JW and Flusher were close, and he had Olaf and Crims over here. And then he leaves, in comes Dennis. Well, now things get reset. Now you've got Olaf and Dennis, now you've got JW and, and Flusher. Crims is kind of the odd man out, veering more towards the JW and Flusher side, and so he leaves with them. That's my speculation, at least. Which leaves people like Lecro, Twist, and Pauf kicked out of the team to re be replaced by them. Now, Pauf, you notice, here's a key detail, <coughs> just disappears. I mean, Pauf. One minute he was there, and Pauf, now he's gone. Not really relevant. Lecro and Twist, I imagine, were just talent left over, and because they were removed from Godsent, the Fnatic players decided we'll get these guys. Obviously, Twist has a history with Dennis and all of my stuff from LGB. So let's an analyze the teams themselves, what they lost, what they gained, and then the implications. So Fnatic. First of all, most, like I said, I assume it was the players leaving, not being kicked, even though some of these players, JW, obviously underperformed fairly heavily over the last few months. I actually think that the first thing you have to state before you analyze the game is just look at the historical component. The guys in Fnatic just lost their two most decorated players. JW and Flusher won all the Fnatic titles under this Swedish era of the team. They were there for all of them, all three of the majors, all of the titles in the Pronax era, all the titles before the Olaf and Crims era, all the titles in the post-Pronax era. These guys have won all the titles and at different times have been key members, but never the superstar members in general. Like Flusher, okay, he has his best stats at the majors, so you can say he's a big game player. He's a huge contributor in that sense, but in the best lineups they had, at times was hovering around like third, fourth player. I think at times actually, considering Pronax was incredibly important in-game leader at times, you could make the case it was fourth or fifth, depending on what, which era you're talking about Fnatic in. JW was the original star of the 2013 Fnatic, the one that won the first major, but kind of like a failed star. He never really quite made it. He only really got his shit together towards them bringing in the, the Crims and Olafmeister pairing when they made that team where they'd had Gfinity, that they made to the semis, they made it to the final of ESL on Cologne, and then they went to Dreamhack Stockholm where they only made it to the semis, and famously there was like the traffic incident. But interestingly, in that match against Titan where they got 2-0'd, no one showed up in this game except JW. He did pretty well, he had those two aces, one on Dust2, one on Inferno, that mad one where he no-scopes existence through the box with the last bullet in an AWP, because it's just JW things. 
So I also think in that era, when they got the Crimson off my um, lineup really rolling, actually for me, JW was the best, second best player towards the end of that year. It was mainly Crims was actually super hot for like three lands and it had been incredible online before that when they first got him over the end of the summer to autumn. And then it was JW at the time, the opener hadn't come in and he was just so insane and he was everywhere and he was hitting all those crazy no scopes and pushing up on people and that wild card element really helped define that era of Fnatic because everyone else played this standard, this default style, this Swedish team play style with good rotation calls by Pronax. Crims was super solid and extremely good from that support supportive role position even though he's just really playing supportive spots and carrying from there and actually Olofmeister was kind of just a, a luxury player at the time, like he, he was a very good player but never really had to be a star player. Obviously that changed in the later days and JW had his issues in 2015. Flush had a period in probably the summer to autumn of 2015 where he was one of the star players. And Crims for me was always one of the best players in Fnatic up until basically this year actually. It was this year when he had his issues, especially when Olofmeister left. Now, first and foremost, one of the key things about Crims leaving is that's the real killer to me here because it breaks up the Olofmeister Crims combo. For me, if you're making combos, best combos in the history of CSGO, you're going to have, like, obviously, Get Right and Forest used to be the clear number one, right? I think Crims and Olofmeister overtook them last year because, I mean, they had everything in that combo. They had players who'd each been the best in the world. They had players who were fantastic in terms of playing together directly, which obviously Get Right Forest very rarely ever did in the team, but also in terms of overall impact on the team and the roles they fill, because you had fantastic 2vx winners, amazing in clutches where you, the, the two of them against three or four players, we've seen them win many of those rounds, a superstar player in Olaf Meister, who has playmaking ability, the support player, but who's a, a star from support and absolutely incredible in terms of bringing all the fundamentals to the game, which is obviously Crims. They even played Sites together as CT famously. I mean, the two obvious ones were B on Inferno in late 2014 and A on Mirage in late 2014 or late 2015, when those were really two of their top three maps. And the, the way those two played those two sites defined Fnatic's incredible CT sides where they would routinely get double figures, if not as high as 12 or 13 rounds on CT side. Now, in terms of what the team loses as well, as, as, as well as the historical impact of those playing, players leaving, first of all, they lose a lot of experience, obviously. Those players have been and seen and done it all, won it all, had their primes at different points in their careers, played with other members for many, many years. And so, in terms of Crims and JW, sure, they've each had their struggles over the last few months. Crims mainly when Olofmeister left, and then when Olofmeister came back, he started to pick it up again and buy E League. He'd actually got his shit together by the most of E League. Actually, he did pretty well. JW looked out of place for quite a while, did sort of reinvent his game later on as a non op player, bizarrely. And actually, I think if you look though, that Fnatic lineup had quite a small map pool. And I actually think that's why JW looked good, but I still think he never got back to actually being an above average pro for like a top 10 team because if you look at it his two best maps were Fnatic's two best maps they were Cash and they were Cobalt I don't think this is a coincidence because they were such a firepower based team and on CT side this is a team that was able to win on CT side because he, these were the two maps he could be effective on we know playing that dropper on Cobble, he was very effective there playing in A site and pushing into the main on Cash really good spot for him he could fuck around the doors these two spots he looked like the JW of old on CT side other maps he really didn't and he wasn't effective and I think that's part of why Fnatic struggled to have that impact on other maps and I think it's quite key actually that Fnatic's CT side is what got bashed in by the guys from Virtus Pro so they couldn't actually maintain that in, just in terms of skill against Virtus Pro which is interestingly enough so I think in terms of losing JW, not as big a deal. Flasher has been up and down on last few months, but has been very good at certain points in time. He was actually one of the few guys who did well in absence of Olaf Meister and Crimson has gotten it back together, but has put him a huge historical importance to defining the style overall of the Fnatic guys. To me, he was like the one guy who you could always rely on aside from Olaf Meister at his peak to really always come with a solid performance and to not get rattled, etc. Very good under pressure. Interestingly enough, at the end of the era, this shows how far JW was from being an AWPer, they'd even started using Crims as the primary AWPer at the end of that E-League run. So they lost out on experience, obviously, but what did they gain from this move? Right, first of all, let's start with Wenton. 
Wenton, when he played at EPL, looked pretty lackluster to me. If I When I saw him play there, I saw his games in Fnatic, I thought this is not a Fnatic level player. He's not a good enough player. I don't see what he brings to the team. Is he friends with these guys? I actually thought to myself, cynically, they've purposely picked up a player here who has no real future joining Fnatic. They're just picking him up because they're friendly with him. They think they'll get along with him. As a result, they'll do what he's told. And crucially, he won't be good enough to threaten even the notion of having to think, do we not bring Olaf Meister back if he's not 100%? And they're still going to want Olaf Meister back. So in a, in a way, it was almost a cynical but a clever move by Fnatic. That's what I had thought, actually, when I saw him play. But somehow he's ended up in this lineup as an official player. Now, is that because they need to announce some players now to be able to play in leagues, etc.? Is that because, by Wenton coming back, does that make a three out of five rule because he played at the offline finals, which allows them Fnatic to keep the EPL spot? I think there's all sorts of fuckery afoot here. That's my speculation because I don't think Wenton's going to play it. And I think... Here's, get, put your tinfoil hats on, boys. Except it's not really a tinfoil conspiracy. I just think it's a reasonable s s speculation to suggest that in the next three months or so, another player will join Fnatic, a better player than Wenton, and he'll just be like a sub player or something so they can retain the spot by some fuckery, some rules lawyering. And the, a better player will join and you'll see more firepower on Fnatic from that player. That's my prediction. That's what I think will happen. Because I surely can't think that went and joined the team is the final solution here. But you're allowed to say that. Just because one guy used it in a fucked up way doesn't mean I can't say final solution. It's the final solution. Not. So, Twist joining. Here's the thing with Twist. He is good. And I think he has the potential to be very good. Because I've seen him do it throughout history. And I've seen him do it on key occasions. The problem I have with Twist is that when he had that return to form at Dream of Malmo, where he was absolutely, I mean, I thought about making him my MVP of the tournament. I really did. I thought he, he was that good. Overall, I gave it to Seize because he also had an inc insane tournament. And even though he lost in the final, but it was a close affair. I think if Godset had made the final, having those extra few maps to really cement it, I think I would have given Twist the MVP, even if they'd lost. Because I thought he was that good. He was absolutely insane there. Orping, rifling, he had it all going for him. But... He hasn't maintained that form or really even come close to it since Malmo for me. So that's kind of underwhelming, but it shows the level of firepower the guy has. And I think he's a very skilled player and crucially a very versatile player in terms of this, the weapons he can use at least. Now, Twist joining Fnatic, good news for you. So they lost that experience. They lost players they played with. Twist has played with Dennis and Olafmeister. They were in the classic LGB lineup of early 2014 that made it to top four at the EMS one Canavite, the second major, the one that they managed to get a win on Mirage against Virtus Pro, who were like unbeatable on the map, it was an overtime game. And also, at the event afterwards, played Virtus Pro again in the quarterfinals of Copenhagen Games. And so a very skilled lineup, and a lineup which when it died off, we were really sad that they all disappeared. But obviously we got Olaf and Crims back, we got Jay, we got Dennis back eventually in Fnatic, and now we're getting Twist in Fnatic. So let's see what he can do. And the weird thing about Crim Twist in the past, this is also why I suspect he did this move now out of necessity, is that he's someone where we know in the past he has had offers, particularly from NIP. But he's bizarrely, and never properly been explained, turned them down. Now, people speculated, was it something to do with he didn't like to fly? Was it something like he just gets nervous in big games? Does he only want to play with friends? Whatever it might be. Well, now he's in Fnatic, and now we'll get to see really what's going to go on there. Because I think there's a guy who, talent-wise, always should have been in better teams than he was. I mean, LGB got to the level where they were good enough for his talent, but they were too short-lived with that sick five-man lineup, which was just early 2014. The 2013 lineup was a different one with Makaleli and Huiten, however you like to say his name, and I'm glad I don't have to say it very often anymore. So I think the fact that you have three former teammates and who played a run-and-gun style in LGB in Olofmeister, Dennis, and, and Twist, that helps because you've got a basis there and they already play a run-and-gun loose style anyway in Fnatic now. So I can see him being able to plug right in and I know this guy can be an AWPer, so you can plug him right in as an AWPer if you want as well. I think this also shows the way friendships work because like I said in the opening part about how Crims seems to have veered to the Jedi Blood Flusher side as opposed to being with his ex-LGB mates of Dennis and Olfmeist on their side of the equation. Because if Crims had stayed, they could have had a team that was four of that exact lineup that was in early 2014 of LGB. Instead, he's chosen, chosen to leave with JW and Flusher, who were really more the fanatic core of that era, not the guys, they were actually with products, the only players that stayed around when they kicked out Schneider and Devilwalk. So, Lecro joining is an interesting one. This is perhaps the most interesting in terms of the how variable it is, because he has shown an upside 
But I still think he's very unproven. I mean, he's very raw. He's very new to the top scene. He, they, apparently, they just plucked him from like FPL or something crazy like that when they got him into God Center earlier in the year. I think he was just talent scouted. But playing with people like Olaf Meister, with people like Twist, with people like Dennis together, not having the pressure to have to be a carry player or a star, I, I think this could potentially bring out the talent in this guy and we'll see what he's really made of. Right now, though, very much unproven. Doesn't necessarily have to be a star, obviously, in a team like that. Presumably, this means Dennis becomes the in-game leader because I forget if they said that actually he had been at A-League or not. I know that they'd stopped using Flusher a while ago, and I think at some point in time, Vugo was doing it. So interesting stuff, but I could see why having Dennis do it would make sense. I mean, the guys in G2 look better when he was doing it for a while. I think that overall, he uses that loose style, and that's the style he's always played around, and that's the style he wants to play around himself. So I think it makes a lot of sense with all the players they're getting now. Interesting enough, though, taking Lecro out of the system and Twist as well, that you had with Pronax, putting them in this loose style, that's where, for a player like Lecro, I have my question marks. For Twist, I know he can play the other style. I don't think that's an issue for him. It probably opens him up a bit more, actually. If it's someone like Lecro, I want to see what happens when he doesn't have this world-class in-game leader holding him by the hand or telling him what to do or setting him up to make plays. <laughs> or making the calls from on CT side when someone else is, you just got to play your position at a point in time because someone else other skilled players playing his position. Now, this also means quite notably for history that that Fnatic lineup with Dennis in never gets to win the major. As much as people were going crazy about them and all year everyone introduced them as the team that's won three majors and two majors in the last year and all. Yeah, I always kept saying, ah, let me just point out, this lineup has never won a major and they never will now. So they had their run of the six titles in a row. Then they won nothing else. They only made one more final actually, which is E-League. But admittedly, they still had like top fours everywhere else. Top eight at MLG Columbus, obviously. They still never went out in any group stages, which is very respectable. That's something to note, by the way, about the Olaf Meister Crims era. The, their team, the, the, the core that they were in when they were with this Fnatic team, never went out of a group stage of a single offline tournament ever in, we're talking about two years. Made top eight at every tournament. In fact, only finished in only the top eight. I think it was two times ever, which was Columbus inclusion of poker. Now that's just fucking bananas. That just shows why, also in terms of accomplishments, you can literally say they're the greatest combo over Get Right and Forest, who were obviously superstars in early CSGO. Now that also means to me, when you consider the two majors that this Fnatic lineup played in the Dennis lineup, that ultimately they failed at the majors. You can't say they really accomplished their ends because they finished fifth to eighth, losing to Astralis at Columbus, and they finished in the semifinals against the Team Liquid lineup, which on paper you should have been able to beat. They were a brand new lineup and only played at one land beforehand. You're supposed to be able to beat them, especially because they're going against you skill wise. You're supposed to be getting to the final if you feel like that. They didn't. So for me, it had to be considered a failure. I think that, along with the E-League result, is what spurred this on. The fact that they lost E-League. I think they really had to win E-League to have a chance to keep going with this lineup. I think their loose style went too far in that Fnatic lineup. They went too much just on skill only and tried to just headshot people. Instead of using at least some basic fundamentals and then adding in the skill element and playing heavily off your aim, that's fine. You could have some of the basics, though. You could at least have proper executes and strats. You just don't have to use them in the most precise way. You just have a couple of flashes and a smoke and, a, and whatnot come in. You can't just go as... They, they went too far the other way with it, where I can't see that working for tournament after tournament after tournament. Like, I'm amazed it did early on, but eventually it didn't work out when Olaf Meister's level dropped off. And obviously Olaf Meister has never returned to being that top five player in the world since he's had his injury. Now, in terms of godsend... I thought they had a promising lineup before, but obviously some issues. Like for me, their real issue was like star power, firepower. Twist looked like a, like he was going to be like a Nico, Oscar type guy on that team, and then kind of fell off after Malmo and just became a good player, like a good international player. But you needed a star player on that team. That was the issue for me. And the others were too raw, too green. Schneider's just never going to be a star again. He was just a good player, decent enough player. So the issue there was they had the tactics, they had the team based on, they had the system, but what was the firepower going to come from to enable that system to win and place highly in tournaments? Because you look at it, fair play at Marlboro, okay? They had a close semi-final against Nip, they were almost in the final, that was insane, but then they fell off. They'd already been bad before that, but they fell off. They were terrible online still after that tournament, they'd been terrible online before that. They didn't get out of the group at the fucking minor. The minor. Not the major qualifier. Not, not, not major. Not, they didn't get out of the group at the minor. 
DreamHack Summer, they had a revival. They made it to top four. They lost to the champions there, Immortals, two to one. They actually won a map, whereas, for example, NIP didn't in the final. So a mixed bag of results, but ultimately a bit underwhelming. The odd good performance, basically. Now, what I think they lost was they lost their obvious star player, which is Twist, and they lost the prospect, which is Lecra, who who knows what could have happened with him in six months. Removing Pauf, I don't think he was ever going to make his top player, quite frankly. I never really understood why Anders like, bigged him up that one time at DreamHack London. I think he just did that thing where he picks like 50 players and waits for like three of them to become good, and they claim he knew they would always be good. Um, in terms of what God sent gained... Well, they gained the core of those championships in the past, so a lot of experience and players who know what they're doing and players who know how to play with Pronex, cru crucially. The problem is they they end, they gained the end of the championship core that wasn't really the star end. Like, for me, Crims has been a star for a decent amount of time, but then you look at the last, like, nine months or so, and he's been on the back end of that star thing. Like, he hasn't really been a star in that sense. It's been an all-around all effort, and they had such a skill team, he wasn't really a star within that unit, the Dennis lineup. So I actually think that at the moment, the sad thing is, God sent got all this experience, so they've got got rid of like having to new the newbies. But now their problem they have is they actually lack for star talent still. So I don't think they fixed that. Crims could be a star, still has to prove that he can do it. And now again, he's gonna have to do it without Olaf, which is what he didn't do in the last Fnatic lineup when Olaf was out of the lineup. Flusher, for me, has to now become some sort of star player. Like people have bigged him up so much, said about his major results and how great he was and all the great tournaments he had. Certainly, he has been a very impressive player for a play guy who played on a team with other stars, but now he really has to do it a lot himself. And he's playing with Pronax again, so it's not like he has to be the in game leader. There's no excuses there. So to me, the pressure really is on JW and Flusher. Flusher, because he has to live up to the what he was able to do in Fnatic, but JW hasn't been a star for so long. And now you're looking at this team, they need a star player. And actually, if I'm Pronox, I say, you know what, JW, you're back on the AWP, mate. You're our primary AWP, you're going to play in these spots here, and it's time to go to work. You can't have this bullshit where you're just buying shotguns all the time, and you're just messing around with, like, custom weapons, and you're just sitting back while guys like Olaf Meister, Dennis, Crims, Flash, win the game for us. You have to actually be able to do something now, because we lack firepower, and that's something historically you were able to do in those past teams with Pronox. Now, the key thing for me, for God said that they gained, was people that can work with Pronax. Because to me, I think if you see this move, this shows me that that whole flusher, that loose flusher is going to be the in-game leader style shit that the early fanatic of the new lineup with Dennis at late 2015 started using was actually more based, I think, around what Olaf Meister wanted. I think Olaf Meister wanted it, and he convinced some of the others that this is what we're going to do, and it's got to, we've got to go more towards this approach. And you know what? Olaf Meister was right. It worked for Olaf Meister. It made him the best player in the world again. But I think ultimately it wasn't that great. And I think actually you've seen now that guys like Flusher work better within a product system. And even JW does, because he has his place within that for what to do. So I think that you've seen that they want to go back to the product system. And I think that's a good thing. And it helps products, obviously. Interestingly enough, they now have four of the five members who won the first major with Fnatic. I have to say, I think that's one of the big flukes of history, them winning that major. So that's not such a great thing in itself. Also, there's the whole Schneider thing, which we can't go into because not a lot of details are known. There's only rumors. I'm just going to spread rumors. But there's some sort of rumor that maybe there's issues with him being able to go to the USA or something that held Godsent back in the past. Did you see Godsent at any events in the USA? When's the last time you saw Schneider go to an event in the USA? I can't say more than that. That's the only part that I feel comfortable saying. Don't know the rest. Wouldn't claim to have the facts. But it certainly seemed to be some sort of elephant in the room. And I want to know, is that still an issue now? If it isn't, okay, fine. Because what if the next major's in America and they have the spot and then he can't go. That's a big issue. You'd assume if they go there, they must have things figured out. Maybe it'll all be resolved by then. Maybe there's nothing to worry about. But that does bother me because it's in the back of my mind that it's never really been addressed. Now, apparently the players are going to be the co-founders of this org, which is kind of weird because it means, like, how does that work? Like, wasn't it already an org before? Was it just a temporary name for a team still? How was it working exactly? I mean, to be fair, they only attended events like... There was the minor at Dream Actors but then aside, from, which was just in France, and then aside from that, there were just events in Sweden. So how did that all work? I still don't really understand that, but whatever. They make them the co-founders of the org. It's going to be a player on org. Maybe, is this the same as Astralis? Is there a, a big amount of people who've got most, of, who've actually bankrolled the whole thing and they have small percentage shares, something Astralis hasn't really publicly revealed. They just told you to go and look it up yourself, which is suspicious in itself, but whatever. Good for them. People like JW, people like Flusher need to secure their futures at this point in time. Don't think they're ever going to be at their super peaks again, probably. So it's good for them to start building some kind of a brand that they can be involved with beyond just being players one day. And the interesting part of this is when you ask yourself, who got the best of it? Now, what's funny is initially, I think Godsend, as in 
God Sent have got the best basic blueprint where they've got this pre-packaged lineup that can work with Prolax. I mean, every player in the team now has played with Prolax because obviously Crimson's playing with the last Fnatic and all the rest of them played with him in the original Fnatic lineup. So that seems pre-packaged to work with the Prolax system and to be a good team. Like that looks like it should immediately be a fifth to eighth level team in the world. But I actually feel like in the longer run, I actually think Fnatic has gotten the better end of it, which is weird, because like I said, I don't think Fnatic initiated a lot of this. But by that, what I mean is, I still don't like the loose style of play. Like, I don't think that can make Fnatic the best team in the world. But I will say, when you look at their lineup now, so they've got Olaf Meister. Obviously, we know he can be an incredible player. They've got Twist, who can be a pretty strong player. And when Dennis is in the lineup, who's been peaking recently in Fnatic, now Twist maybe only has to be your third best player. As a third best player, this motherfucker can get it done. Then you've got Lecro, who's a huge X factor. Who knows what can happen with him in the future? When I admit, I don't see much from, but I think he's going to be a replacer. I think he's a placeholder. So I actually look at the Fnatic lineup, and I think they've lost a tiny bit of firepower. But even then, is it that much? I mean, they might have gained if Twist can play well. So I actually think the Fnatic, the firepower still lands on Fnatic's side. Godsent still lacks for some firepower on their side. So I actually think ultimately the way this move can be rationalized is I think for right now, both teams just got closer together in level because you, a little bit of firepower maybe went for Fnatic, but they still got the firepower. Some experience went to Godsent, but they didn't really get that much more than firepower right now. I think what happened is Godsent went tiny bit up. Fnatic went down to Godsent's level. And so now to me, Fnatic's further from the top, Godsent's slightly higher up, and I'd put them both around like, for the next three to four months, I'd expect them both to be like fourth to eighth in the world. I think that's a reasonable expectation right now. It doesn't seem like either should go on and become superstar teams. And as a result, yeah, it's weird because it's one of those moves where no one's really solved any of their issues. In fact, in terms of this move, in terms of the fact that no clear winner right now, I think this is a lower level version of that first French shuffle. Well, when it first happened, I even actually said, there's some sort of podcast somewhere where I implied that like, maybe LDLC, because they had superstar players, can get it together in the future and be super good. But I actually think initially, the team on paper that worked in terms of role balance was the Titan lineup, the Kaylee, Kenny S working with the existence team. I thought that was the one that on paper made more sense initially. And obviously it did. It won Dream Max Stockholm. But in the end, LDLC went on to be better. I think it could be like that in this scenario. Except I don't see people winning events in the next few months. Obviously you can never really know. Because teams are more than the sum of their parts, right? But certainly interesting in that particular kind of a sense when you think of it that way. Now, the major implications of this going forwards is that... Uh, oh, I'll say one other thing as well. Now that this move's happened, I don't think either team's really like won out big. And I think it's actually brought both, it's brought God set up a bit, but it's brought the Fnatic guys down. I think the real people who should be cheering this move are Navi, who never could beat Fnatic, um, Virtus Pro, who lost a lot of times to Fnatic lineups, SK guys, who never had to face Fnatic again. Admittedly, they were better than Fnatic, that's why they never had to face them, but never had to face them and beat them. I've got to go with Virtus, well, I already did Virtus Pro, who else shall I say? Yeah, fuck it. Those will do right now. <coughs> so I think those are the teams that should be cheering. They're the teams that won today with this move, in my opinion. Now, the major implications for this, as in literally the major implications, is first of all, and this is crazy, because the spot in majors is retained by the players, that means three of the five players from Fnatic's semi-final run are in Godsent, so Godsent automatically becomes a Legends team and is qualified for the next major, which apparently is in January of 2017. That means that Fnatic will have to qualify through the minor system. Let me repeat that a second. Minor system. As far as I'm aware, unless something is wrong, since the team Godsent did poorly, no, actually, since Fnatic is knocked out entirely, unless I'm mistaken, this means they literally have to go through the minor system. Yeah, they have to place top two at the minor in order to get into the qualifier, as far as I can tell. So that would be crazy in itself to see Olaf Meister in a fucking minor. That seems like the system's gone wrong when that has to happen. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That's surely not what the minor was designed for, to find like up-and-coming talent and then draft them through to the qualifier. The major qualifier is going to be fucking nuts. Consider, imagine if Fnatic qualifies, okay? That means that you can have in the next major qualifier, assuming all the teams that have to go to the minor again can qualify, you could literally have Fnatic... Envious, G2, Mouse Sports, FaZe, Dignitas, Nip, Optic, TSM, Immortals, Tyloo. 
Like, if you put those 11 teams in a tournament, like a Dream Act tournament, actually, this is a fucking fire tournament. Sure, it doesn't have the best teams in the world, as G2, who is one of the best teams in the world, I guess. But this is a pretty sick tournament. How deep is this thing? That's the fucking qualifier for the next major. That's going to be bonkers. Now, Godsent, like I said, get the legend status for the next major. But interesting enough, because they just lost the EPL qualifier, it won't be a Pro League. So no EPL there. And in itself, that opens some a whole can of worms. By the way, on one level, because of all the hypocrisy of people like crying about org zoning spots in like E-League, for example, but now the same people, including Rennie Champions of E-League, are going to just shut the fuck up about the way it all works in EPL because, oh, the flag's different to the person who we've got hard done by, so no need to complain about player rights there. I'll talk about unions. Interesting how integrity works, right? What a shame. Now, in terms of this huge shuffle, because obviously this is a momentous day, I have to say that I still think, unfortunately, this can't really compare with the first French shuffle because the first French shuffle took two teams, three teams that were all like potentially top 10 in the world. You had LDLC, you had Titan, who were very good, but not the majors. LDLC was a very solid team at all other events and had done top four at the major. And then you had Epsilon, who finished top eight at the major and were like a rising team, but was mainly Shoxi and Kiyoshima. You took three teams, and the best thing about that French shuffle was it just merged all the talent from the three into two and made two really good teams. And if Kelly hadn't been banned, I still think what could have been with that Titan team, I think they could have been a very dangerous fifth or sixth best team in the world. Famously, with an edge over Fnatic. So they could have been the Kryptonite to Fnatic. So very interesting in that sense. So I don't think it can really compared to that because that was a crazy one where literally overnight suddenly you created two potential world champion French teams initially seen from the lineups at a time when Nip was falling off VP was floundering Na'Vi still hadn't really gotten it together and so you really thought like holy shit Fnatic hadn't actually won a big tournament yet they'd only made it top 4 at Gfinity G3 where they actually lost to Titan and then they made the final to Nip but lost there in close fashion so you didn't know if the new Fnatic could win under pressure in that sense so you really thought this could be the future of CS and it was in a way especially obviously in as much as Envious or LDLC at the time went on at one point in time to be the best team in the world and were one of the few teams who were challenging Fnatic in terms of winning titles as well during their era so I don't think it can really compare to that one but it was obviously a momentous day in CS even though it was a bizarre set of moves